Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for a very special screening. I'd like to especially welcome our guests in the audience who are not Toro Law students and Toro alumni, although we hope that one day the front row may be a Toro Law student. So uh, welcome. I also would uh, like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, um, Amistad, the Long Island Black Bar, uh, our student group, also the Black Law Students Association, the uh, Criminal Law Society, and the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is also an agency that is, has an office at Toro Law Center in our public advocacy center. You know, I am uh, a, a point of personal privilege. I am really thrilled to be able to screen this documentary at my law school at Toro Law School because one of the people central to this film is somebody who for years and years and years has been my mentor and my hero and that is Scott Fine who is central in this documentary and who made the trip to be with us here today and so you'll uh, hear from him and his perspectives on the case and his involvement later on after the film. And I really appreciate um, all of the efforts that uh, the filmmaker, uh, Scott Gall uh, Sean Gallagher did to uh, enable us to screen this film with you. Uh, he also made the trip from Westchester. You'll meet him after the film, as well as Kirk Allen, one of the uh, students who uh, calls himself a subject of uh, the film but uh, you'll hear his story from his own words. He's a uh, school teacher, and today was the first day of school in Rockland County, and he went to school, did his job, and got in the car and came out here to be with us uh, tonight, and I really appreciate that as well. So uh, Professor Klein will moderate a discussion after the film. The film runs for uh, roughly 70 minutes. Um, I think you know a little bit of the background from the promo material that has been at the school, but the one thing to keep in mind, the one thing that kept resonating uh, with me as I watched this, and I have seen it several times, this was 1992 when the events that you're going to see occurred, and the, the scary thing is we have to question in all kinds of subtle different ways. Um, how racism still exists, not just in America, let's bring it down to New York, and not just in New York, but in our own hometowns and our own communities. And so this is but one example to enable us to have uh, a really good conversation after the film. So with that, I'm not gonna take up your time, let's roll the film. Okay, I would hope that uh, the three panelists we have here are familiar to you. This is Scott Fine, who was the attorney who won the awards from the New York State Bar Association. <laughs> Sean Gallagher, who was seen interviewing some of the people who were speaking, who is the filmmaker. Kirk Allen, who was also interviewed. He was one of the students who was there uh, at the time. So. Uh, let me perhaps begin with um, a question to whoever might want to answer it. How do you respond to someone simply saying, what was the big deal? So there was a two-second examination of these black students. They just simply had to show their hands if there was no cut. Um, then they would just go on, the, on their way. What was the harm here to these people who were stopped by the police? Let me, if, if, if I may, um, there's a predicate to that. Okay. There's a predicate. Just to, to fill in some of the story blanks, because I think Sean has done a tremendous, and I mean this, I've said this again and again in telling the story. I, I've never told a story with pictures before, and it, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. But, uh, let, me, let me do this in a minute. What happened is, as depicted, the police, the state police, say, oh my God, 
uh, we have to solve this crime. The reason they had to solve this crime is it was a very high profile crime. It involved an elderly woman, woman who was staying at the home of the chairman of the board of trustees, and the police felt they had to solve the crime. They first got the list. They stopped these students. When, after about 10 hours, they didn't find the suspect, they concluded they were going to stop Af every African American in the city of Oneonta. Now, one has to imagine what that's like. You're walking down the street. There are three and four police agencies going up and down for five days. They stop you randomly. They ask for an alibi. They ask to see your risks. Risks, they don't communicate among one another, so there's no sense of checking you off the list. Uh, that, even that would be painful. And so what I would ask you to envision is people, African Americans, in this primarily white community, walking around, police officers in their vehicles up and down, and African Americans, every time they see a police officer, just rolling their wrists back and forth to say, I am not cut, please don't stop me. And that was the scene in Oneonta. A hundred people, three hundred people, doing this back and forth. So to answer your, your, your question more, more directly, for those people who said, big deal, I was one of them. Until I said to myself, I, I grew up on the island, on, Long, on your island, on Long Island, um, in a, in a middle-class Jewish home in Plainview. Um, and I said to myself, had the state police investigator said, tell me something, had the, the, the woman said, you know, I couldn't see anything, it was dark, I had my glasses off, the only thing I could see was a star of David around the assailant's neck. Only a star of David, Jewish symbol around the assailant's neck. And the state police officer said, investigator said, okay, where do the Jews live? And went to every Jew and said, so let me see your hands. I could only imagine the reaction in the community. There would be, it would be more than an uproar. There would be federal indictments. That would be so inappropriate. And so I found myself asking, why is something that would be so inappropriate, so socially inappropriate for my people, good police work when it applied to another community? And so, point well taken. I think each of us personalized it a different way, but that was, that was, that was the way I saw it. But let me ask Kirk, perhaps, because there are any number of claims by people involved here that it so impacted upon their lives, it ruined their dreams. People dropped out of school, even though it happened September 4th, there's that one person saying maybe it impacted upon how well they did on the midterms. There's even sort of an explanation that someone was convicted of murder in the second degree in Florida because they dropped out of school because of this, so that therefore this questioning in the blacklist was responsible for that person's life being ruined um, for having been convicted of murder in the second degree. But could you just respond to some of those concerns? I, I think that that's pretty accurate because if you take this incident out of Ali's life, where would he have been? He would have still been in school, uh, still been in the gym, still hanging out, going to classes, and doing the things that a normal student at Oneonta would do. But when you introduce this incident into his life, he wasn't the only one. His case was the most extreme. But there were other kids that couldn't deal with being there because, like you said, we came from the inner city, most of us. I, you know, Poughkeepsie, New York, I know you don't think it's like inner city, some people, but it's top 50 in violence in New York, in the country, and top three in New York State. So when I went to Oneonta, this was supposed to be my Shangri-La, where I escaped all this. And now the cops in my town basically were transported. And it's even worse now, because you go in there with this feeling that, hey, you know what? Uh, this kind of thing would not happen in my neighborhood, or, or could happen in my neighborhood. It's not going to happen here. All the protection, everything that was promised, it was going to be so liberal. Everyone was going to look out for me. But at the critical moment, no one looked out for me. So yeah, it does change your life, and it does make you look at the world differently, because you realize whether you're in your neighborhood or you're at Oneonta, what's changed? What's different? If I get educated, I'm just an educated black dude. I'm still that guy. If I go back home, I'm just a black dude that's educated that came back home. So it did interrupt a lot of our lives. Some people went about dealing with it a different way, 
Um, and, and yeah, it, it really did impact it. That's it. And um, Allington, I, uh, from speaking to He was Al the one who was convicted of murder in the second degree in Florida. Yeah, uh, you know, talking to him through letters, um, Allington doesn't believe that because of the blacklist, that is why he's there today. He just sees it as one thing that affected um, where he got to in his life. Um, you know, his grandparents uh, raised him, and he was involved in drug dealing before he came to college. And they reached out to Bo. They, Bo promised them he could get them away from struggles. He would get them away from, from feeling uncomfortable. And he brought them up to the college. And when he got to the college, he became a leader. Uh, you know, I was heartbroken when I found out Allington was in prison because I was trying to get a hold of him because he's in all of the video. He's in all the photos. He's one of the student leaders. And really why I felt it was important to bring out that he's in prison now is because he was such a leader. He took this role as a drug dealer in the, in the urban setting, came up there, became a leader of student organizations, and everything that he thought he was building up just destroyed him. Destroyed him because he was one of those who was stopped and asked to show his wrist? That and also he was, he was told to come up there to get away from these kind of things, to get away from being stopped on the streets. And it, the first week that he was there, he ended up getting the same things happening. So it sounds like, Scott, maybe you can answer this, that you're sort of saying, or some people are sort of saying, that this is part of the picture, the same thing that happens to blacks in the city of New York. Eric Garner, for instance, who was choked um, by the police officer, or the same thing that happens to Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, um, when he shot and killed. That sort of, it's, this is part of that same in, picture. In, in a way it is, and in a way it isn't. And, and maybe it, this is a, a bit more nuanced. I came into this thinking race profiling was this up against the wall circumstance. Cataclysmic, death, uh, wrongful conviction. And 14 years later, what, what, I, what I realized, and for, for some of you are, are gonna be skeptical of this, I, 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 perhaps I approach it with some skepticism too but it's a series of assaults every day on your psyche. It is, as one professor said to me, now deceased at Oneonta, he said, I have twin boys, and I tell them they can be anything they want in this country, anything they want in this country. And one of them says to me, Dad, how come these women cross over the street when they see us coming? I guess they're a little afraid of us, but we can be anything we want. Or we walk into an elevator and they make room for us. Or we go into a store and they know they can't follow us anymore, but their eyes follow us. How, Dad, if, if the majority of this country is frightened of us, how do you expect us to feel? And it's this binary quality. And so I, I, I realized, it took me 14 years to realize this, and I don't want to overstate it, but racism is not bad people doing racist things. It's good, progressive, kind people who do small little things that chip away at one's identity day after day. It is when one wants to cross a crosswalk and you'll notice that the cars stop a bit slower for the white pedestrian and perhaps accelerate for the uh, uh, non-white pedestrian. It's these incredibly little things that you think can be fixed, but as a recipient of that, you, you, you you wake up every day and you say to yourself, how am I going to be embarrassed today? And so I, I would say that my, my perspective is it's not a murder. It's not, uh, it's not a wrong quote. It's not a Zimmerman issue. It's the things that people of color and other ethnic groups confront every day and swallow in order to get along in our society. Um, and that's, that's the sort of racism that I think we focus on. So when you talk about the hands, I, think, I, I, I do think the director did a great job here because it's just the hands. Big deal. But it's the hands on top of everything else that occurs. You want to add anything to that? You know, the, one of the things that always strikes me in this is uh, Jamel Champin, Cheryl's brother, when he says, it's the idea of what they did. That's what's scary. Um, you know, the police didn't come up to them in a very verbally threatening way. They very much asked them to show their hands. Um, but again, it's, it's the idea of this, this overall idea that you can stop 125, more than 125, they stopped everyone in the town. But is this racial profiling? I always picture racial profiling as an assumption that people of a certain race 
must have committed the crime or are committing crimes. Here there was a clear identification of the attempted rapist as being black. And then there was questioning of those who were black. So could you just explain why you consider this racial profiling? Well, in my instance, later on they said, within a couple of days, they found a bloody towel on campus. And the bloody towel had a DNA of a black male. This is 1992. You tell me how that's possible in 1992. I walk into my dorm room, and right at the cage, there's an RA. And what does she say to me? Hey, the police were just here looking for you. For what? For a rape. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. We get into a debate, get into an argument. I curse, she curses, we curse each other. At the end, I said, if this was a white male, would you go and check all 8,000 white males? Uh, no, but that's not the law. So it's the law to check all you know, 100 and something black males, that's the law. So it is profiling, because they used whatever they could to justify whatever they were doing. And, and that, to me, was it's a major problem, a huge issue that I had. And even someone who was older than me at the time, who was supposed to be more sensible, couldn't understand that what they were doing or what they said was wrong. I, I, think, I, I think race profiling is a, almost a misnomer sometimes. It's, it's really race-based policing that we're talking about. For example, sir, you're wearing a, a kippah. You're wearing a yarmulke. Third row, raise your hand. Oh, you, both of you, right. <laughs> right, right. Brothers from different mothers, right? <laughs> and, and actually, I, I just saw you lift that guy's wallet. Just saw you lift his wallet. I go out to the police and I said, look, I just saw someone who, you know, based upon all appearances, is Jewish, lifted his wallet. Okay. All points bullet. I want you to stop and interrogate, you can only go so far, every Jew in Suffolk County. We'll find him. Don't let him leave Suffolk County until you, you find that wallet. It, you say to yourself, well, that's not race profiling, right? It is race-based policing. If you only know one thing about the person. And indeed, when we went to court, the woman said in her testimony, I thought he may have been black, it was dark in the room, and he may have been young because he ran quickly across the room. In the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, we lost because they said, oh, when you add the young descriptor to black, it's not race-based policing. So you, you, it, I, I would say that it's not race profiling that's the danger. It's generically allowing the police to say, based upon someone's race, we can go to the Bronx and stop everyone in the Bronx. Um, you have to place limits on, on the case. And I should mention this. We, we were going to the uh, United States Supreme Court, which those of you who are here know is the highest court in the land. We sort uh, uh, we, we asked the court to hear the case. Everyone was excited about it. Every law school dean that you could name participated in the brief. And uh, the uh, certiorari was to be considered uh, on September 16th, uh, 2001. As you know, on 9-11, 2001, five days before, uh, uh, race-based policing uh, became not an outlier, but became part of our national security policy. So that, that was a dramatic paradigm shift in the way this country looked at race-based policing. What exactly did happen in court? What was the outcome? Well, we saw that there was some, there was some money paid to some people, but can you Right, it, it was, was? A, I'll try to make this, this quick, and I see in the front row, we don't have law students yet, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but think about it, it's a great job. Um, <laughs> We went to, we, I, I, my, my decision, my decision, it was really a joint decision, was to go to both the state court and federal courts. Uh, when, when the state police were unmoved and unmovable, we decided that we would go to state and federal courts. And the reason we decided the two venues is uh, some causes of action were state causes of action, others were federal causes of action. I won't get into the detail at this point, it would, but, but, but we had a strategy. In New York State Court, in New York State, there, you could not, if, if, if you, your constitutional right was impaired, you were not permitted to go to court and seek compensation in a civil context. In a criminal case, it would, evidence would be suppressed. So if they did away with your right of religion, your right of speech, anything you wanted, 
you could not see compensation we decided we would challenge that in this case so we went up we got to the court of appeals it took six years that's not good lawyer and by the way that's bad lawyer in to take so long and six years we get up to the court of appeals i walk into the court of appeals and i said judges of the court they're called judges i don't understand something if there was a tile here and I slipped on it and I fell down and I hurt my knee, I could sue you for compensation. If you did away with my religion or my freedom of speech, I couldn't sue you. There's no, there's no right to sue you. Um, they wrote a 32-page decision, and for the first time in New York State, we had a constitutional right. If, they, if any state agent does away with your constitutional right or impinges upon your constitutional right, you can receive compensation for it. That, that was a big win. I thought that that meant we won. Huh, how wrong I was. We had all these people certified as a class. We were going to have a class representative. We were going to have a trial. And a state judge said, too quick, Mr. Fine. We don't believe you have a class here. He certifies the class. You're going to have to have 150, 200 separate trials. I, we had a million plus dollars invested in this case already. We couldn't afford so many trials. And so what we had to do is select two representatives who might agree to do, and we selected Cheryl Champion because her case as a woman was particularly noteworthy, um, and Ricky Brown, who was the named plaintiff. In both instances, they prevailed, but no one else recovered because justice is expensive to pursue. Uh, on the federal side, uh, we did not prevail in either case. So that, that was it. It was just those two cases. Were there, were there trials for each one of they, those? There were trials. And just to give you an example, and I don't want to over because my colleagues are the ones who did this, but the nuances. So I'm in the middle of this. We are in the middle. We are in the middle of this. You have not been born yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we were in the middle of this, and the CIA, I said that the state police made up evidence, as they did, about the dog, about uh, blood, about everything else. Someone gives me a note and said, Scott, it's an anonymous note. Check on something, the CIA. As it turned out, the state police troop, catch us. one of the investigators from the state police troop wants to go work for the Central Intelligence Agency. Okay, that's that, the, the, you know, espionage, or an espionage agency. He goes and he interviews. He's doing incredibly well. He's so smart in Washington at Langley, Virginia. And he moves and he moves. Now he's into his second to the last interview. He's being subject to a polygraph examination for participation in the covert section of the Central Intelligence Agency. In the room was the deputy chief of the covert section and the polygraph operator. And the deputy chief of the covert section says, sir, I just want to let you know we don't want any choir boys or altar boys in this particular division, meaning we want the people who will take risks. He said, you don't have to worry about me. Let me tell you what we do in the Oneonta barracks. And then he proceeded to describe how they first identified a suspect and then moved around to evidence, a la the dog, a la the blood. The CIA polygraph investigator just stopped. He was shocked. They reported it to the FBI. There was an investigation, an internal investigation. Two police officers were sent to jail, two state police officers. The guy Chandler was forced out of the department. So I share that with you because that was a pretty exciting moment to discover that. Sean, could you talk a bit about how you got involved in this whole? Sure. Um, so I went to SUNY Oneonta many a years after Kirk. Um, and I was in my senior year at the college, and I was taking a documentary studies class and started trying to ask people, figure out uh, a story to tell. Um, obviously, couldn't go farther out in the world. I was kind of stuck and isolated in Oneonta. And uh, one of my friends mentioned the blacklist, which I had never heard of before. And this is my senior year of college. And I consider myself a very, very well-informed student on campus. I was very involved. And it really just shook me that on this college campus, there was no mention of this incident. Uh, at this point, it would have been 17, 18 years after it happened. Um, it, I, you know, congratulations to the school for completely sweeping the incident under the rug. They didn't have to bring it up anymore. So we interviewed Bo. That first interview you saw with Bo Whaley was shot back in 2007. And um, 
you know, I, I, I put that together. Uh, it was just his interview. I wasn't able to interview any of the students. And, you know, finished that as a 23-minute piece. And the day before I graduated, Dr. Kathleen O'Mara, who you saw there with a the purple streak in her hair, she called me in her office. Uh, I had never met her before. And she gave me this giant box, basically. She had kept every newspaper article, every uh, tr uh, transcript of anything going between administration at the school. She had kept that back in 92. And she said, if you want to tell the full story, here it is. Going through it, I was horrified how inaccurate my 23-minute piece was. Uh, there was just so much to the story, so many elements. I didn't even know about Scott Fine's work uh, pro bono. Um, so when I started uh, years later finally reaching out to people and interviewing, I really expected to find these people who were going to be really bitter and really upset about what happened to them. But what I found were people like Kirk who took this terrible thing that happened to them and really were able to not make it a, pos make it a positive thing, but more make it an experience that they could learn off of. And I found that really fascinating, all these people with positive experiences out of such a terrible thing. Kirk, do you react, how do you react to his characterization of this being a positive experience? Kirk, how are you doing today? Greatest day of my life, Sean. How are you? Um, I'm pretty optimistic, and I, and I agree with Sean. I, I think, you know, during that same week, going back to part of your question from before, I went home, and, and my story is a little bit different from some of the guys. Um, when I was a senior, I was living on my own. So when I met Bo, I was with my tennis coach who, who brought me uh, to the college. And we had gone to several other colleges. And w initially, Bo said to her, you know, it's a great school, blah, blah, blah. She said, yeah, but what are you going to do for him? He's like my son. And he said, if he doesn't go to class, I'm going to drag his, I know they're little kids here, blank, blank, in the snow to his class. And um, she said, that's where you're going. When the blacklist occurred during that Christmas and, and Thanksgiving break, I went home and I had an incident where I'm playing with my dog on my lawn and a police officer drives up and he says, what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm stealing the dog, dude. No, I'm actually home and I'm playing with my dog on my adoptive family's lawn, so I have to explain to myself while other kids that come home from college are watching these cops um, look at me. So. I had to deal with this whether I was at Oneonta or I was back home. Um, so is it positive? It, the sense that it's positive, yes, because no matter what the obstacle is, I think in life you have to go forward. Uh, you, you fight what you're going through, but if you stay in that, in that, just that time period mentally, you're never going to get beyond it. And, and yeah, it never leaves you. It's always with you. It's always going to be with you. But if I stayed in it and I was angry and I was bitter, I don't know what I would have become, because there's always that potential. No one thinks, well, I'm going to do something really horrible. But I, I went to leave Hartmark because I'm, I was the assistant treasurer at the time. So I was on committees with this gentleman. You know, he handles money, so uh, we, we meet. Imagine if I was angry and so angry that I would lose who I was at that moment and did something rash. What would I become? Where would I be right now? So you, you can only try to be... I don't know, I guess positive to get through it, but it's always going to be there. I have to show this, you know, and talk about this with my family and my friends. And for a while, I really am thankful for Sean. I buried it. Like, you know what? I'm just going to live my life and, and, and live in a world that says it, it didn't happen. Like Oneonta tried to wash it away. I guess a lot of us did the same. And, you know, most of those administrators were there when I, the administrators when Kirk was there were the administrators when I was there. None of them ever got punished for this. They acknowledged, some of them acknowledged that they did wrong, but they never got punished for this. Uh, you know, at the 20th anniversary, most of the administrators were retired by that point, but, and I'm not holding the, the new president accountable for the 20th anniversary, but as much as I was so excited for there to be a 20th anniversary, the fact that they never reached out to Kirk or any of the other students this occurred to, you know, the only reason they wanted to hold this event was because they were afraid students, current students at the school, were going to hold the 20th anniversary. They wanted to control the agenda of the day. Just the name of the event, Beyond the List, it was basically saying, let's get over this, let's move on. It's better to not think about this and just move on. The plaque where the tree was from the 20th anniversary, it says Beyond the List. It doesn't say the Black List. And uh, fun fact for you, that tree um, 
they totally drowned it when they poured water on that thing. <laughs> that tree has not grown one leaf since they planted it. <laughs> and one more thing, uh, it's kind of ironic. So my roommate who lives in Albany from Oneonta, he's like, uh, still wanna play tennis every once in a while? I'm like, sure. So I joined his team and we're playing in the 40 and over league. And who happens to be my partner? Someone that he knows that's the head of campus security, Bruce McBride. So Bruce McBride and I are playing doubles together. And when we get done, I said, Bruce, I think we have something in common. He says, what? I said, you, you, were you in charge of uh, the Oneonta security back in the early 90s? He said, yes. I said, are you familiar with the blacklist? He says, what a, I can't believe that happened. He said, yeah, um, I'm number two on the list, Bruce. Nice to meet you. So it, it's, it's ironic how small world it is. But Bruce, you know, he's repenting for what happened. And lucky for him, that he was on vacation that week, because who knows what would have happened to his career. Scott, there's a comment that you made on the film about connecting this with other or with some faulty police work done by Troop C or done by, um, yeah, Troop C, that other cases of theirs sort of fell apart or police lying was shown. Can you just elaborate that on that? That was a CIA issue. I mean, that, that was a CIA issue. The, the police, state police are, um, they're a force in upstate New York. They're not a force down here necessarily, but you'll notice if you see a state police officer, they, they wear gray, they, wear, they have a Praetorian purple, they don't wear badges as, they, as officers do because they consider themselves uh, paramilitary uh, and that is, that is their history. In upstate New York, uh, most communities rely upon the state police and thus it's paid out of the general budget. If they had to purchase their own police department, it would be very expensive and so they're given a, a great deal of deference. When the state police speak, everyone shudders, including their local legislators, because if the state police decide not to police in an area, one has to then begin to hire their, their police department. State police I have an enormous amount of respect for, but sometimes bad cops are bad cops. I used to be a prosecutor, and um, most cops, most officers are pretty good now at weeding out bad cops, and, and uh, the state police uh, have not been as assertive. Their view is we are a military organization and we take care of our bad officers our, ourselves. So, but let me just say something before I forget. Who here are law students? Virtually everyone. I, I knew the first row was not, by the way. <laughs> I, I picked it up. I, I just, I, I really want to commend the law school. I'm afraid that the, the, the dong or whatever will happen before. Um, I am envious of you. Um, because this school has a reputation of sending lawyers out into the world that do just this. Um, uh, and and I am, I'm 65, and I, I realize that, that at 65, I've got another 10 years of trying to, as they say, the world wobbles as it moves through the universe, and our job's to take the wobble out of the world. That's our job, and just to make it a more coherent and fair place. And, and so as I sit here, I said, I was have 10 years, who's gonna do it? Who's gonna, and each and every one of you are gonna do it. And, and that is a remarkably good feeling for someone like me. So, so thank you, thank you for, for being there, thank you for attending the school, it's cool. Thank you. <laughs> let's, let's open it up. We do have a mic here for those of you who wish to ask a question. So I would invite someone to come up um, and ask, okay. Uh, I'm not a law student, uh, I'm an attorney. I'm a uh, practice uh, based in Garden City, and I'm here on behalf of Amistad Long Island Black Bar Association, one of the co-sponsors of this event. Um, for Mr. Gallagher, my question is, I noticed that the general counsel for SUNY Oneonta is conspicuously absent in your portrayal. Did he or she have any part in this in terms of um, you know, being the first line of defense of someone to say, I don't think we should do this? I'm sorry, by general counsel, you mean? The general counsel for the school. A SUNY Oneonta. Um, like their response to it? Um, you mean all of the whole administration? Why didn't you interview that person? Is the right, question. I'm saying what was, that, what was the general counsel's part oh. in this decision? My, my thinking is that the general counsel should have been consulted as to, gee, do we hand over this list to the police? There, there was no general counsel. The most, most, it, it, here, here's the, the structure of the state university system, if I, if I, if I can intervene in, in one of the problems. 
uh, New York used to have 62 teaching colleges and agricultural colleges. Nelson Rockefeller in 1956 decided that he should bring them together into the State University System of New York. So these teaching and agricultural colleges, the large, you know, it could be Cortland, Oneonta, I mean, all through Delphi. Um, he brings them in. They're doing incredibly well. They're being supported. Uh, come late 1980s, 1990s, you know what happens? They're not making their numbers. They're given campus-based budgeting. If they did not bring in students, they would have to fire professors. What they decided to do was to recruit students from New York City and other urban areas, African-American students, who came with subsidies. Now, if this sounds like a form of slavery, intrinsic wealth, this, they brought the students because of their intrinsic value. They bring them into these small pastoral areas. The only thing they forgot to do was acclimate the areas. These are communities that knew of 100 and 200 middle-aged African-Americans who grew up, and suddenly 300 and 400 young African-Americans, half of whom wear their baseball caps backwards, are roaming the streets. They didn't have a lawyer. The community just did not know what to make of all of these youngsters who parachuted into their community because they came with stipends. They came with academic subsidies. The State University System of New York had a lawyer that purported legal services, and that he turned a blind eye and deaf ear to the issue. Thank you. Anyone else want to ask? How you doing? Um, my name is Randy Smith. I've also been the victim of certain profiling. Um, about 10 years ago, after being stopped numerous times by police officers, I decided to become a police officer. Ironically, um, I became a state trooper. I've been a state trooper for about 10 years. I've been upstate and I've been downstate. My question would be, as a trooper, now a sergeant, given the information that these investigators had at the time, how do you balance the victim's rights in solving a case while also protecting the rights of possible future victims, as say in this case? What could the police have done differently in order to possibly solve the crime while respecting everyone else's rights? If I could just direct that for a minute to Kirk, because did the students ever say to one another, well, there's a clear description that it was a black guy who had attempted to rape this woman, so we understand why now they're asking us to show our wrists. Did the students have the conversation that was just suggested amongst themselves? Uh, not amongst the black males. Maybe there are, some, uh, there are some white males that felt that way, like, come on, guys, it's okay, what's wrong? You should just do it. It's fine. You know, they don't mean anything by it. But when I was with my fellow African-American students, man, this is crazy. This is some real bull stuff. We, we never, I don't want to swear because y'all are here and you look so cute. Uh, <laughs> we never agreed with what they were doing because, again, that's what we left. Um, and to go there and see that again, if I grew up always being the person that you're looking for, to this day, when I see your trooper lights go on, I'm like, oh man, what I do now? What I do now? You know, I might have my grandmother in the car and I'm going 40 because she's like, baby, you're going too fast. Grandma, come on, it's 40. So that fear is always there and there's no way in heaven or hell that I'm going to think, yeah, you guys did the right thing. Know this, when I was a kid and we played cops and robbers, Nobody wanted to be the cop, because who wants to be the bad guy? I hope that answers that question. It does um, seem as though there was a lot of white support for the black student indignation of what was happening. There absolutely was uh, white student support for what they did, but there was also male, uh, my, my roommates who knew me, um, who I played basketball with, who I ate with at, you know, during breakfast and lunch. They understood who I was. They knew my character, so they were not supportive of what happened. People from the outside who didn't really mix, yeah, they thought, you know what? I believe those black guys could have done that. But the guy that was sharing your room with you or getting notes from you in class, totally different point of view. Totally different point of view. Um, you know, off of your question of what should have been done, um, I guess the main thing, even though it wasn't revealed till years upon years later, they were looking for someone with a cut on the hand when the woman said she thought it was cut on the shoulder and they were looking for someone on the Oneonta campus. There's a possibility it could have been someone at the Oneonta campus, but for them to 
only focus on there when the police dog turned away from the campus. To me, that's futile police work in a bit, in a way. Um, you know, there were, they did do things that I think were totally proper and smart things to do. They went to the veterinarians, they went to the uh, hospitals, they asked for the cuts there. But again, they were searching for a cut on a hand that didn't exist. What exactly was the story with the canine? Because I think that showed some press coverage right afterward that seemed to indicate that the canine, the dog, led the people, led the cops to the campus. Right. Uh, well, there, th this was part of uh, the, the officer who had the dog, uh, followed the dog and made a left and went into Oneonta. When, when there was a lot of press involvement, and that was about the fifth day, Chandler, who you saw on the, stay, on, the, on the screen, said, no, 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 let me explain this. The dog led them to the campus. Uh, so I would do what you did, I, I gotta, or I, you would do what I did. You got a hold of the uh, state police report. It took me a while, and it said, made left with dog. Um, initially, it was listed as attempted burglary. That was, the, that was the, the file document that Chandler filled out. When the New York Times printed it, it became attempted rape by black men, which is a very scary thing for white people, attempted rape by black men. Burglary, not so scary. But to answer your other question, which I think is just a, a really profound question, goes to the heart of our system. You know, I'm a Democrat, just to be clear about this. So what I'm about to say about Republicans, you should have to take in context. But we will say we can make the environment much cleaner by installing pollution control equipment that you have that companies have to pay billions of dollars for. No, 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 no. We should not pay billions of dollars. Government is over-regulating. We can deal with a slightly degraded environment. Food, well, the government should be very careful and control everything. The 16-ounce uh, 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 containers of soda, no, 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 don't do that, say the Republicans and even some Democrats. That's over-regulation. People should be able to do what they want. Well, that's the truth of crime as well. You have to make choices. We can, years ago, they would, outside of Bloomingdale's, I think, they, there was almost a line of police officers, not a, quite a line, but they'd stop people to see if they shoplifted. They look in their bags. People said, that's outrageous. They said, yeah, but this is how we catch shoplifters. You make a decision that your personal freedom, our, our racial diversity, our personal tolerance is such that, yes, perhaps the guilty on occasion will go free, but it does not merit an oppressive police state in order to try to bat 100 on the resolution of crime. Or, and so says this Democrat. Good, e <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Tarsha Smith. I'm an attorney, and these are my associates. <laughs> they, they are great, but they are so well behaved. Hey, look at this. This is Hiya. How did, you get, how did you get involved in this case? How did you come in to this? That's what I wanted oh. to know. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for asking that. I mean, I appreciate that. Uh, look, I, uh, I did a stint. I was a prosecutor. I, I went up to the governor's office. I worked uh, for Governor Kerry, who preceded you, you may not know, and then Governor Cuomo the first, if you will, if the current one is the second. Um, and so Governor, and, and so I was their criminal uh, just this guy. I was tough, I was mean, and the only thing I quickly came to realize was that there are always two sides to a story. When the American Civil Liberties Union came in and said, you know, it's not quite the way you see it, Mr. Prosecutor, I'd say, you know, you make some good points. So I tried to sell the governors on the notion that maybe there are two sides of the stories. They, they, they were both against the death penalty, so that was an easy sell. Then I get out. I, you know, it's time. I have mortgages I have to pay. <laughs> So I go into the private sector in the American Civil Liberties Union and, civil, and the New York Civil Liberties Union would periodically come and say, Scott, you know the guys up across the street, can you, they come with these kids. I'm happy to do that. It, it made me feel, it appeased my, 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 my sense of greed. So, um, and then two weeks after this happened and the community was upset, they came in and they said, uh, the ACLU and the New York Civil Liberties Union called and said, would you meet with these people? They seem to be upset. I'm happy to meet with people. So I met with them. Uh, they said, can you fix this? I said, sure, can. It's, it's, it's horrible. Of course I can fix it. 
and I called the governor's office. I met with uh, the first assistant counsel. Um, I met with the people I know. I called the superintendent of state police, who happened to be a friend of mine, and they told me to pound salt. I was really shocked. I mean, I mean, this was egregious. I thought this was a laydown. And they were simply going to say, yeah, no, we'll have a policy. We're really sorry. This is good police work. That didn't ring true with me. And so it became like a La Brea tar pit. But to answer your question, why did it take 14 years, other than the fact that, as I'm fond of saying, a really good lawyer could have done it in a third of that time, it was every day I wanted to get out of it. Do you know that? Every single day. I mean, let us not pretend I had a family, I'm building a practice, uh, um, but every day or every week there was a revelation, and the revelation was they lied. You know, they did this before. These kids are subjected to this day in and day out. And it was like, it truly was the La Brea tar pit. Um, I wanted it to end. It was expensive, and I wanted it to end. And then at some point, like, what do they call it, the tipping point? I realized, and maybe it was six years into the case, it was more important to finish this odyssey than to, to conclude it. But, but I don't, the heroes are, and I want to be clear about this, they were the students uh, and the faculty members, some now deceased, unfortunately, who persisted year after year. When I wavered and said, my God, how can this go on? They said, buck up, continue to do this. So I was sort of the weak link. They were the, the, the strong members of the team. But that, that is a, an elliptical response to a good question. Um, okay, last question, I think, because a lot of the students here I know have classes that are going to start in a bit. My name is Rose Subotnick, and I'm a faculty wife. Um, back in the 19, late 1940s, there was a law passed in Massachusetts, which, among other things, Made it, made it illegal uh, for applicants to colleges in Massachusetts to put their photographs on applications because, can you hear me? Because there was a possibility of being discriminated against. And uh, by the same token, I think one of the reasons that I as a Jewish person am shocked when you make the analogy to how would a Jewish person feel is that I have the safety of knowing that my identity isn't going into any official record. I don't like they did in Nazi Germany have a Jewish star on my passport or anything. So the thing that occurs to me is, was it such a good idea to have a, 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 an easily available list that this administrator could find and just chuck off everybody who was black? Wouldn't it have been better if somehow such a list were not available, or at least not easily available? Yeah, I was wondering about that as well. How come there was this list? It seems like, give us a list of every black student, and then they were able to hand over such a list. There, there, there's, a, there, there's a process, there's an analysis called a Hobson's choice. And without getting into the details, it means it's, you have to choose between two competing virtues or two com competing evils. What is, what is the strength? What is the virtue here? We want to make certain that our state universities, our, our, our state institutions, give minorities a break. We want them to include them. We want to count them. We don't want these administrators to be mealy-mouthed. So we, at any point in one time, want to know how many African Americans and Asians we have. Good reason, because if you're playing games, you're going to go re recruit some more. Everyone deserves a break in America. The other side of the ledger, there's a list. Now, the protection against that was something called the Buckley Amendment, uh, written by a, it was a conservative senator, and he, he said, if the police want access to the list, they have to demonstrate a real and an and apparent danger. So in this case, the state police came to SUNY and said, uh, to Oneont and said, we want the list. The guy said, uh, why should I give you the list? There is a black rapist roaming among the students. This guy said, yeah, I guess real and apparent. It was made up. It was made up. The dog went the other way. Um, so that's the problem. But it was the list by itself served a purpose, uh, but it should not have been a a accessed. And also that, um, that, that list, um, when they interviewed the uh, 
the IT person who printed out the list, uh, he said that it took eight seconds for him to select the options to print out that list. And that's how quick it was uh, able to be done. Uh, after all the controversy started, the police promised that they were going to uh, throw away the list, although they had already made copies of the list. And then, I mean, Scott, how long would that have been? 12, 13 years later? Um, they <laughs> go into court and they bring in the list. They never even threw it out. Kirk, you want to just give some final words? And then I'm sure that uh, guests can speak individually to some people afterward. Let's just sort of end the formal part of this. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Self-deprecating. What? It's a, it's a shtick. <laughs> Thank you. I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. For those of you, for those of you who couldn't hear the comment, it was just thanks to Sean for having made the film. It was telling Scott that he was a great attorney, and thank you for all your dedication for all of those years working on this. Um, and Kirk some final words that you might want to? Um, I, you know, every time I see this, I, it's, Sean will tell you, it's hard. Uh, I relive it. I've never, I, I've never finished watching the entire thing. I've always had to leave for whatever reason, you know, and, and the part that uh, probably gets me the most is when I hear my voice at the rally, because I knew Dr. Donovan and I, and I knew how powerful he was. And when I saw him uh, pretending that he didn't have any power and you know, I've never met an administrator at a college that didn't know what to say. And uh, I knew he could have done something. I, I knew Leif Hartmark. So uh, just going through that again, it, it's tough every time. But I've said, I'm, I'm eternally grateful uh, for what Sean has done. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to be sitting next to a great lawyer. He is a great lawyer. He's just self-deprecating. Um, so I, I don't know. If you're going to do the work that Scott did, uh, then, then God bless you. And um, hopefully, if this ever happens again, that one of you guys will be there. And, and, and maybe in some small way, this event will help you to help the next you know, people out there that may encounter this uh, get through it a lot better than, than a lot of the guys that I went to school with. So that's, that's really it. And if I could perhaps just end with something that Scott had told me when we had a reception um, before the program started, how we sort of end these all of the law students because they're about to, when they graduate, start on a great adventure, which is how he views having a law degree. It just opens so many doors and takes you down a path that could just be extraordinarily important and extraordinarily fascinating. So thanks so much for having come. Thank you for having us.